and, and she just probably felt that instinctively that she couldn't complete herself with a man who, who was so narrow. So narrow, so primitive. Mm. Uh, so childish, childlike, yes. yeah. uh, demanding, mm. of energy, full of yeah. love and devotion. Yeah, but, could just play with him. And she did. And, and women story, do do yeah. this. And they do. Don't they? It's called shit testing these it days, is. guys. Yeah. This is an allegory of the shit testing of all shit testing. <laughs> the, 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 this led to every problem that's ever come ever since. Why women tend to be drawn to bad boys mm. as well, to an instinctive throwback to earlier times when maybe the bad boys, if you like, would go out and, and do the hunting and, and bring back, you know, the goodies and all the rest of it and uh, be protective, um, you know, socially. So, you know, you, you, can't, you can't escape that instinctive pressure. Yeah. It's, it's, it's there, isn't it? And, yeah. it? and it will be put, and it will push to be realized. You get the anima or the animus that you deserve. Welcome back, everybody, to Young to Live By. That was a quote from Pauline that you're going to see later on in the show that I thought penetrated straight to the heart of the subject material that we're talking about today, which, of course, is carrying on with Lilith, and this time more about what the story of Lilith is all about. So if you didn't see our last episode, which went out a couple days ago, Steve and Pauline wrote a trilogy of novels called Lilith, and the first one of which is currently in pre-production as a film, Lilith, The Last Temptation of Adam, and you can check out the trailer for that by clicking the link in the description down below so last time of course we talked about where the story came from we discussed that well steve basically went into his unconscious after being inspired by his muse which was pauline of course went in sort of red book style and this story sort of emerged in many ways not quite fully formed but it was there as a coherent narrative and so today i begin by kicking things off asking steve what is the story or about it's a mysterious thing of course if you haven't picked up the novel then of course it's like well what is this there's this immortal goddess she's got this beautiful yet numinous face from the, from the trailer what's going on of course it begins with lilith stepping out of the proroma out of the collective unconscious as an allegory to the christian story as laid out in genesis we have to we have to stress that of course this is not an alternative to the bible this is an allegory it is a form of mythic jungian fiction where they take that feminine principle and apply it to the more masculine principle that already lies underneath within genesis it's just an extra bit of story i think to illustrate a jungian psychodrama so that bit of hygiene psychic hygiene out of the way let's ask steve what is lilith all about well, she begins with the beginning, at least, of the creation of this material world. But just to repeat the qualifier that this is an allegory and it's not a statement on religious belief at all in any realistic sense. It's a psychological story. Um, Lilith, in this sense, comes from a world beyond this world, which, taking from the Gnostic tradition, is called or referred to as being the Pleroma. And she's a primordial goddess, uh, the feminine, basically the feminine principle, but it does not exist in this material universe. But at the beginning of the story, she sees the created Earth as you would see it suspended in space, with all of its colours and its, its luminosity and its attraction, and she's beguiled by that and drawn towards it with an intense curiosity. Um, and as you, as you follow the story, it, the first thing that gets you is the emotional connection that she makes to that. Like, why is she attracted to this? Like a moth to a flame. And it's very unexpected for her to find creation in this material sense. So she's so curious, she wants to instantiate mm. within the created earth. That means that she has to become material herself. And being a goddess then, it's her own will. She creates herself out of her own will and rises up into the Garden of Eden as it's portrayed in the story and as she rises up through the earth which in the story is of a blood red hue that earth is alchemically transformed by her instantiating and it becomes in effect her blood soil by allegory and if you want to take a biological allegory then that's in effect her transcendent dna if you like is then instantiated into the soil itself so what you have there is an allegory for something coming from the unconscious into consciousness consciousness of herself as well 
in a different world. So you can think of this as being the anima, if you like, uh, coming in as the original feminine principle into the material creation by her own direct act of will, she believes. So with respect to the, the consciousness of her as an archetype, then it's limited. And if you think about it, archetypes, if they are real and have any psychology, are actors who follow a script which is organised by a higher organising principle. So they would be limited in their consciousness as, for example, are the Greek gods. This is the case with polytheistic religions that you get elements of the psyche collectively, the human psyche as a whole, spread out amongst the various actors who perform the roles of archetypes or aspects of personality. And this is true of Lilith in this allegorical psychological story. So when she emerges into Eden, she comes through with a certain degree of consciousness, which is hers innately, becomes material, transforms the soil through which she passes and realises herself as the first woman in the material world. And that then is an allegory of the anima appearing in the world, in this material world, from another realm, which is also analogous to Plato's concept of the form, the form of the feminine. So normally the world of the forms is inaccessible, which of course the pleroma is, unless you follow specific uh, pathways and, and guidelines through a Gnostic tradition. So I, I borrowed it from that to show how a form could self instantiate without the mediation of another human being for those people who are informed on, on Plato's idea of a dialectic but psychologically anyway it's really about the instantiation of the anima in consciousness with the consciousness that that archetype possesses and that's analogous to the limited bandwidth of a polytheistic goddess so think about the Olympian gods they have very definite roles a very definite range of consciousness but she's the first woman beguiled by creation by the material world that's like if you wish the ego self axis too and how archetypes will communicate with consciousness by coming along that axis so allegory and myth are usually the best ways to illustrate psychological facts because they carry a very very broad symbolic bandwidth which includes emotion intentionality, pre-configuration in the terms of archetypes because they are prefigured and separate from ego consciousness and development but they're still limited. Now the actual bandwidth of Lilith's consciousness is reduced as she comes into creation which is interesting if you think about it. When she's in the pleroma and therefore the collective unconscious then she has a different cast of mind, but the act of coming into consciousness narrows that and makes it more focused. She then becomes the feminine principle instantiated within matter. That's one-sided. So by becoming material, she's suddenly interested in her opposite, which would complete her. That's the masculine principle. And then she experiences that in Eden, in her encounter with Adam, the first man. But there's a bit of uh, a bit of a surprise latent in that as to the actual identity in this allegory of Adam in respect to Lilith as an archetype. Who is he? Who is he really? Uh, and that's how the story progresses from that point. Just want to say while you were speaking there, I was having a coffee that Jane brought me, and turns out there's dog food in the coffee. And we, 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 we were just joking beforehand that it might have been. I didn't see the coffee come in the room. It was going to be a ghost. It was a trickster coffee. Yes, it is. There is dog food in, 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 the, in the old coffee there. Oh, my God. But, yeah. Um, it, it, what, what strikes me, and this is because I'm, I'm a young man and uh, with certain persuasions, Adam's reaction to Lilith turning up is something that um, it resonated. Amidst the trees of Eden, a shape shimmered and moved. All green he was, with tawny bark for skin. His eyes, one of green and one of blue, followed her, and knew her truly for who she was. Then Adam saw her, and was immediately beguiled by her incredible beauty. Surely she was the most perfect thing in all of creation, and... 
the Lord's promised wife and companion for him. Woman? Thou art woman? Yes, my companion thus has promised unto me by the Lord, my wife whose body I shall know and who will love me. Lilith too felt an attraction, an attraction to her opposite, to Adam, the first man. Man thou art, and the first of your kind, and so different unto me in this, my material form. Adam knew not what she meant, but his joy was unbounded. Come, let me show thee paradise, a garden laid out here by the Lord, a place of everlasting happiness and joy called Eden. Lilith, goddess of the Paroma, the eternal uncreated void beyond this universe's finite bound, smiled at the innocence and naivety of the first man. This paradise is Eden called, but what of you? she asked. I'm called Adam by the Lord, the first of humankind. And I am Lilith, created through act of mine own will. Lilith, it is you, exclaimed the first man slowly, as if by recognition of her from within his very soul. But then Adam's brow furrowed, as a first nascent glimmering of the true human consciousness gnawed at him. Created, you say, by act of thine own will? But what is that? What, what is will? All things are created by the Lord, and I in his own image. The, the, way, the way he speaks, it's like, um, uh, almost like a child, actually. Yes. It's, it's, it's like a child who sees something very, very exciting, but he can't quite express himself properly. It's like, that's a woman? And, and he doesn't quite understand it either. It's like, God made you. God God must have made you. And all these other kinds of things. Was, was Adam, or this first Adam, written deliberately sort of that way to be a young lost boyo, in a way? Yeah, yeah, in, in effect. I mean, obviously, it was written before the rise of the boyo phenomenon. Uh, I had no, I had no, uh, no cultural consciousness, shall we say, of that. But archetypally, yes, because the boyos are just a cultural projection of a deeper structure to do with uh, the male psyche. Yes, he has to be in that state. But if you really read it, you'll see he's actually motivated by two things. His awareness as limited as it is of his creator he's not called god in, in the sense of being the biblical creator by the way you know it, it, it's he's referred to as being the demiurge for you know real important reasons which become apparent towards the end of the third installments of, of the Lilith trilogy but he, he is effectively very low in consciousness and in discrimination of himself but instincts are pushing him and that main instinct is to find completion with what was promised to him by his creator. Now his consciousness of that promise is not through dialogue, but by feeling what we would experience as young men, when I was a young man, and of course you still are, that instinctive pressure to find your reproductive mate at, a, at that very basic level, but also the transcendent factor of the feminine that will complete you psychologically. So he's in that state of very low level consciousness were very very narrow but forceful bandwidths of instinct are pushing him so when he encounters Lilith it's as if he's already met her before he hasn't but he does have an anticipation program within him that was put there by his creator that's the allegory and the, the allegory in the sense of it being that's how men encounter women the virtual image she's already in him as an anticipation now exactly where that comes from is unfolded through the story but yes he does have a low level of consciousness and of expectation and he's completely unfamiliar with how to relate except in that basic urge to reproduce mm. to mate and to be complete because he's not developed as anima but he's feeling the instinctive pressure and when you get this with, with a young man, when he encounters the feminine in its totality, as Lilith is supposed to represent, then you have massive opportunities, numerically if you like, multifariously, for developing neurosis. Because every encounter you have with something that significant in your life 
can lead to frustration, misunderstanding, misfiring of instincts, and that can begin then to constellate this whole array of complexes around that instinctive pressure when they when the individual encounters the projection of the archetype and this is the the, the first apparently anyway the first meeting of that divine dyad of masculine and feminine she recognizes him straight away for being masculine but of being very low in consciousness and she offers him an increase in consciousness but it comes at a cost that cost is that he must be subservient to her which runs contrary to how he has been programmed should we say genetically and by his creator <clears throat> to anticipate the opposite of that so immediately there's a problem and that's the kind of problem you get in the relationship between men and women psychosocially that it, there is a power relationship this, this is evidence at the moment and it's been evident for decades really that the, the shift in emphasis of dominance culturally between either of the sexes although it was never really that simple at all it just appears to be because women in the past were powerful in a different way than the way they're working towards becoming powerful now both of those adaptations generate problems of their own and the culture at the moment is expressing those difficulties produced by those adaptations which are part of the present zeitgeist but with respect to adam he's going on instinct and on the direction from his creator to become complete lilith on the other hand is full of the notion of being the first woman and a goddess in her own right with her own absolute power and she makes those demands upon him to put her first he has to worship her now what that really means by that worship is the acknowledgement and the communication and of the feminine of the opposite which he's prepared to do but then we get to the problem where the ego the ego if you like of this this young low consciousness fully formed adult man wants the anima to be subservient to him in every way reproductively psychosocially psychoculturally spiritually that's it that's what she is for and the anima in the form of Lilith is having none of it and there has to be a resolution to this and also to what's happening in the background i.e. just who this creator figure is this demiurge is the demiurge the biblical god no the demiurge in this sense is the self archetype of Adam who projects an avatar of itself in the form of Adam as a material ego or ego out from itself so you have the masculine principle in in the form of the creator the lower God creator in this allegory who is effectively created a honey trap to bring in the feminine principle from the unconscious to complete itself but he then projects a fiction if you like of that totality in the form of a masculine ego but because it's young it's very very young it's only just been created literally only just become born from the self when it encounters the anima as the opposite it's trying to control it it's trying to dominate it and she is having none of it now the problem for the self if you like which stands behind Adam in this story who has projected an avatar of the self in the form of the little self the ego is that it also wants completion with the feminine principle but it fears rejection so what better way to do that than to create an avatar and push it out and if therefore Adam is rejected the self archetype is not rejected and this is an issue that young men have young women do too of course in reverse when they're forming relationships wouldn't it be great if you could have an avatar that you just send out to go and try and pick up somebody you know to form a relationship and then there's no risk if your avatar gets rejected because you haven't been and yet this is where the allegory comes in again and it's not biblical by the way please do not misunderstand that that if Adam is rejected therefore the the self archetype and therefore the mm. creator is also rejected and that begins the first neurosis the primary neurosis the separation between the intent of a young man to become complete 
through the feminine as projected from the self when that neurosis happens because of, of a failure to connect with, with the anima then you, you, you have that, that, that problem and that then becomes a through line and can do anyway in the individual life of any man the story then is archetypal, universal, and it unfolds following that narrative through all sorts of transformations, um, which we really need to get uh, Pauline engaged on because there is an animus side to this story as well, which is very important, and there are many, many other characters. It, this is just the archetypal situation, if you like, in Eden, and it, it, it sets the bedrock for what is going to happen what happens when you make an enemy of the anima as a young man for example or the animus as a young woman indeed mm. and the uh, the <laughs> animus is there in the form of the avatar of the self i.e the the little ego of adam but from adam and through the the creation myth as it is interpreted and expressed here allegorically you have all of the other men as well. And there are many, many men, many, many women in this story, and they're all articulating together, trying to solve this original problem, whilst Lilith is, is pushing her through line. Where the animal is trying to find <clears throat> its true completion as well. And uh, that, that gets such, such a drama, if you like, of Jungian psychology as it unfolds. But that's, that's the, the, the grounding point, realise She's come basically from the unconscious. As she emerges into contact with consciousness, her bandwidth of her own awareness and functioning is narrowed by that. Otherwise, there can be no communication. Otherwise, the ego is just blown away. If, if an archetype enters into the ego fully formed and with everything, all of its potential immediately released, you get a psychosis. So as it approaches and gets near consciousness, it starts to narrow down and focus and in that focus, you get all of the instinctive patterns which add up to being that archetype. And you get the pressure, the instinctive pressure that's acting through the archetype. So you get that narrowing of consciousness and Lilith portrays that narrowing of consciousness. She becomes a little bit of a caricature of the feminine because she's being approached as if she is a caricature of the feminine. Although she gives hints about what she really is. And this happens to a young man when he encounters the anima and doesn't understand it, he will try to impose a structure upon it. And then you have a filtering effect whereby the the filter that he puts over the anima determines what actually comes through. And it may not be good. So young guys, when they encounter this, this elementary force of nature, this one half of the totality in its pure form needs to have the right way of approach. Otherwise, all the mistakes start to happen and then they start to get grounded and bedded in as complexes, which he will refer to and in, to interpret not only his exterior relations, but also his interior ones. Then you have the pressure from the self as, as well, uh, the self archetype, the psychological self as opposed to the genomic self. But the, the allegory of Eden in this story is that that is the totality. Within there, you have the biological genomic self as well. Then you have the psychological character of the creator. And then you have the, the little ego, the little ego of Adam. So it is an allegory of the basics of psychodynamics with respect to the animal. Would you mind if we went to the end of the prologue or that end of that first section? Because there's, there's a part in there. I mean, it, it speaks for itself. Obviously, it's very th um, theoretical what, what you're talking about. And of course, that's really, really useful. I think the plot actually speaks for itself <clears throat> when you sit down and read it. And the prologue's not particularly long. It's like eight pages or so. Um, and and it, just, it just ends, ends with this. Uh, yet they're true, their meaning um, Adam and Eve. Their true original sin was not, as they had believed, to taste the forbidden fruit, but to deny the goddess Lilith the exclusive love for her Adam. It, that, that to me is just, it's just a frame shift that goes, oh dear, oh dearie, dearie, dear. So, uh, as, as, and I think we can get Pauline on, on, on this as well, because there's a juxtaposition here between Lilith and between Eve, and Eve is the one who gets cursed. So, do you mind talking a little bit about that juxtaposition there, I think, between those two characters and, and what comes to pass? Well, once, um, once the rejection is made, basically, uh, and Adam runs back towards his Lord Creator, the Demiurge, that's basically the ego falling back upon the self to say, I, I can't do it, or something's gone wrong. 
but you promised me, which is an instinctive feeling that, of an anticipation of completion, you promised me a woman. So the self then produces a facsimile, if you like, which, which is not the, not the original intention, it's another version, an alternative, a lesser, lower instantiation. Yeah. It's like you didn't promise me that version, isn't it, yes. really? Yes, it is. You know, he it wanted is. a more submissive version. Yes, yes, he did, um, which is then given to him. Mm. But there is this knowledge then that that's not really what he wants. That's not the archetypal anima. That's not the platonic form. No. This is an ordinary woman, literally, and that, that sets up a problem. But for the sake of the allegory and for Lilith's motive, having been rejected then, she decides to curse... Uh, Eve and all who will descend us from her womb and become the bearer of pestilence and she will eventually choose a new Adam a new individual man it won't be him apparently you know this this is the threat but she's also also trapped and so she will look for a new Adam a new version of him who is better fitted and there's the competitive thing again that we the all feel the competition between the women yeah and there's yeah. A, there is that too mm. reproduction because she's uh, she has reproductive jealousy about the fact that Eve <coughs> will be the mother of the world so she she curses everybody who will descend from that womb but she will find one young man whom she will recognize as carrying the spark in a more perfect sense of the original Adam she'll then choose him to be her new Adam and will then release this contagion into the world which will wipe the slate clean and she'll start again in a new Garden of Eden so there is that um, is that specifically what you were looking for or, or something yeah uh, yes yeah I, th I think think that answers a lot of it it's just the juxtaposition between those two characters and what that curse might represent and especially if it's if it's what that could mean to women as well it's, it's like well Eve's not that form she's more um human as you as you you, you were saying yeah adam or we'll say men or, or or the ego anticipates the actual form so it, it, could that be relevant to women in their own lived experience of themselves not being said form um yeah i, th I think what i was going to say uh, james a bit earlier on really was um which i think is what you're alluding to the beauty of the story is that there are so many real world analogies and young, we young women, um, in the way that young men feel instinctive, uh, instinctive pressure, um, very often, I mean, the, the idea of paradise, for example, um, is, is a very important concept because whether women process it consciously or not, I think they're driven unconsciously towards that notion of paradise, towards the idea of... Um, having a place whereby they can receive everlasting love uh, from one you know individual and and to um have the status of being that that special woman if it's um you know in, in a oppositely sexed couple relationship uh, to feeling that they are the chosen one the the, the special woman for that man um and with that comes idea the idea of uh, i guess status and security um and immeasurable love and pleasure and so on so those notions even for mortal women are are very beguiling in the same way that lilith herself is beguiled by creation and and drawn towards it so um i i think there are some very important parallels in in the story for mortal modern women uh, in terms of how they uh, in their own lives try to ex uh, access the platonic form and, and thereby complete themselves so you know i i think whilst we're we're using a, a lot of metaphor and, and a lot of uh, allegory and and so on there are nonetheless real world parallels and, and I, I do believe that's the beauty of the you know yeah. the story that you've written yeah it has it has to start this way yeah because you have to set the scene for something that, that is so important that yeah. suggests the the birth of consciousness um that that is very very important it, it obviously because there's the birth of it and then there's the development of it and that development unfolds through lifespan developments and there are certain important marker posts along the way of course but Relating to your opposite in Jungian psychology is so, so important mm. and it's such a deep structure idea. It is rooted genetically 
uh, and it's expressed through allegory through myth mm. and, and so forth very mm. well mm. so the story has to start like that to justify what happens yes uh, and, and what follows which is mm. real and transcendence at the same time it's deeply emotional uh, with lots and lots of angst about adaptation and about identity mm. and, and about the meaning of existence and uh, how we relate to instincts and uh, and even to the, the prospect of death. Yeah. Uh, ethics too are tested massively. You know, our, our ideas about what uh, what morality is. Um, and but how... it also sorry, sorry, it also mm. reflects the choices that um, that people make in yeah. the real world. So yes. when when Adam chooses Eve over Lilith. Yeah. He also chooses a loss of consciousness yes, and the does. potential yes. for consciousness. Yes, he does because if in making right. that selection. That's right. If yeah. he if he had um, chosen Lilith, he could have accelerated his development um, and become more conscious more quickly. But he didn't. He he chose someone who would mm. not challenge him, mm. and he wanted that that woman to remain submissive to him. Mm. Uh, Lilith would never have done that. No. But she would have brought him on. Yes. Uh, and that was something that the little ego in the form of Adam couldn't accept. Mm. Um, and the problem was that the self too, the self archetype in the form of the demiurge, this lower grade, not true creator, if you like, who in this, this story had fashioned uh, this environment for this to play out on, as the self does, um, was also damaged with respect to its capacity to release because it was not complete in and of itself. It's just the masculine side of the of the totality. Mm. And when it when such a one sided archetype, if you like, or process tries to control the whole, there is going to be a problem. So the secret is relationship, and therefore the demiurge couldn't relate to Lilith. So the the problem was already preset. Yeah. It was at that level. It was preset. Um, but to avoid the loss of status, then this avatar is pushed out, and the avatar is unconscious of the fact that he's not real, that he's only a projection. And it's the same with the ego. The ego thinks it is real, whereas it's not. It's just an illusion. It's a projection of a much greater thing, which is psychological, spiritual, and biological. And when we do become finally conscious of that, it's only going to be through a proper relationship to what Jung called the anima, because then the ego can attain a higher degree of consciousness of itself and relate properly both within and without. But for a, a story like this that has that magnitude of elements within it, you have to establish the mythological foundation for it, which reflects the truth of psychic development. Mm. Then you go into the drama of the story and of its interaction. Okay, okay. So um, apologies if, if you already said this. I think it's important to, to nail it down. Uh, you, you have Lilith and you have Eve and you have Adam. And it's like, well, for the maximum amount of consciousness, he should have stayed with Lilith. But it was a bit, or, or, or chosen Lilith, really. But he, he, went, he went running back to the self and then he settled for Eve. So in terms of, in terms of, uh, of course, that represents a decrease in consciousness. But as a juxtaposition, what do Lilith and Eve represent relative to to each other? You only got one anima, for example, with, with, within a man. So what well, you have, a, you, have a, you have an anima archetype and you have an anima complex because Eve was the real woman that he related to. So she, in effect, psychologically represents personal experience in your own life. Of any of us, with, with all of its limitations, mm. all of the limitations of relating to a real woman, whereas Lilith represented the potential totality of the Platonic form, but she appears not to be the full bandwidth. This is the problem because when an archetype, as I said earlier, approaches consciousness, it will narrow. You can't relate to it in its fullness immediately. And this is what Lilith would have gotten out of the relationship to Adam. Had he agreed to access her totality properly, her totality would have widened. Mm. But because he approached the archetype in the wrong way, she was narrowing all the time. He, in effect, created the problem himself because of his lack of development. But the archetype doesn't go away. And that's the problem. Yes, yes. So uh, this is why I ask, because there's lots of, I can 
it's because of the potency of the material. It absolutely has to be. I can feel the sort of political winds of, of men and women and all that other kinds of things brewing up. So it's like, okay, Lilith is not a real woman in and of itself you'll meet in the outside world, but you can access the image that Lilith represents through relating to a real woman. Yes. No woman is Lilith. No, no. no woman can possibly carry that no. psychologically no. for a man. It's no. impossible. No. no, absolutely not. And this, this idea of the platonic form is that you have to be in the right shape, as I said in the previous video, to mm. access it. Otherwise, what you create will not be what you want. So your own level of consciousness has to be pre-configured sufficiently to be able to do that. You get glimpses of it, which Plato understood. You can glimpse the platonic form, but the state that you're in with respect to your consciousness determines precisely what you experience and what you get out of that, which is why I said in the previous video, you need to make a suitable vessel, i.e. in yourself. You need to build yourself properly and understand yourself properly before you can move to that stage of anima communication. I won't say integration because you can't, you know. We know this, obviously, because if you try and do that, you are going to, you know, it's, it's like Robert Johnson says about uh, sending in the high tension cables, yeah. power cables through an ordinary domestic wiring system. It'll just blow out. Yeah. You can't do that. You have to go through a process of transformation, as you would with an electrical current, of reducing that down into a form that you can cope with while still understanding the whole picture. If you go in not understanding what you're up against, not <laughs> understanding the whole picture, then you know you're going to create problems mm. that's the allegory of this that, that when you approach that totality it's a dialectic because you she, he basically created the lilith that he got yeah 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 makes sense but also lilith to some extent um mm. sells out yes. and you talk about her consciousness shrinking yes. yes and and again this is what women do in, in the real world mm. over and over again over yes. and over again yeah. in that they they buy into maybe a, a material literally material situation that appears to offer them all sorts of uh, of security and pleasure and and and, and uh, status and so on yeah. um but their own development is arrested yeah. Yeah. and it may be that you know they do that because again there's the instinctive push for reproduction and mm -hmm. then the looking literally to nest build and, and, yeah. and to create a, a, yeah. a paradise within their own context yes. but in doing so they lose the the connection to to their animus and, and their own personal development as well so yeah. i think i think that's relevant in oh, there i too. totally agree and i think you've expressed it really well that that is is a problem isn't it, it you is. know, and, yeah. and even it is like that it, yeah. it, it, it was in this story this allegory it's created as a honey trap mm. um, and so and like you say here look yeah. here's the material all the material yes. that you could ever want a perfect yes. garden everything's absolutely fine yeah and I'm offering you completion yes. but there was a doubt mm. and the doubt was the flaw in the male yes. self yes. archetype yeah and so he produces Adam mm. as an avatar, which is analogous to the ego, to go out and, and to front it. But the ego narrow bandwidth, and so it can't contain the full archetype. And that creates a problem. Mm. And that necessitates, from the male perspective, the need to relate to a real material woman as opposed to a goddess, hence Eve. But if Eve is an imperfect version of... Lilith, and mm. therefore, if an individual woman is an imperfect instantiation of the potential totality, then again, there are going to be problems because if mm. the man expects a goddess and doesn't get one but gets a real woman, there's a breakdown in relationship. The reverse of that, the mirror, is yeah. also true, as Pauline was saying. Absolutely. Where um, Adam just wasn't enough for her. No. And, and, and she just probably felt that instinctively that she couldn't complete herself with a man who, who was so narrow. So narrow, so primitive. Mm. Uh, so childish, childlike, yes. yeah. uh, demanding, mm -hmm. um, full of energy, full of yeah. love and devotion. Yeah. But, she could just play with him. And she did. And, and women story, do do yeah. this. And they do. Don't they? It's called shit testing these it days, is. guys. Yeah. This is an allegory of the shit testing of all shit testing. <laughs> the, 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 this led to every problem that's ever come ever since. And things like that now must have an ancient ancestral memory. Mm -hmm attached to them mm. this is this is why the, the these situations are, are, are repeated over and over yes. again this yes. is why young conceptualized of these inner dramas repeating as being archetypal patterns mm. that are based as he said upon instincts 
um, and why myths he said also are so important because they they illustrate the situation and the problem for you mm. but the beginning of the book is highly alleg allegorical mm. and then it differentiates mm. out and goes through a process of alchemical transformation through these characters as they move on through history until you get to the last temptation of Adam which is a moral choice that Adam in the 21st century has to take when the the drama in Eden is recreated in the present day there is a middle phase too that has to do with uh, the 17th century uh, during the time of the Great Plague and that's an allegory for a middle stage of consciousness before we get to the present level of consciousness in our current century and the opportunities that each of them provide for all of the characters involved to interact properly and to, indiv and to individuate so it is a, a, a good baseline way of working a mythological approach to Jung mm. in a contemporary sense but this is only the first story there are three mm -hmm. and you do see a massive amount of change and development in yes. all of the characters as, as they go through yeah yeah i was just going to add it, it into that steve too that's why women tend to be drawn to bad boys mm. as well um again it, it's a, an instinctive throwback to earlier times when maybe you know the 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 um the the bad boys if you like would go out and and do the hunting and, and bring back you know the goodies and all the rest of it and uh be protective um you know socially so you know you you can't you can't escape that instinctive pressure yeah. it's 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 there isn't it and yeah. it and it will be put and it will push to be realized and yeah. i think as as we talk more about the characters mm. as well and, and and other uh male characters are introduced you can see for example why lilith is drawn to some and not others and, not others, and why yeah. she makes the choices yeah. she makes yeah she she uh she acquires after eden and then when she turns up in the 17th century she's a she's acquired a dark servant who is a, a, a yeah. well uh well reified and refined uh, dark animus figure who is an implacable character um, he's an alchemist um, he's a warrior he's, he's got all of these these attributes to him and he wants to be the new Adam he wants mm. to be loads consorts he wants to assist her in wiping the slate clean mm. he, so he's after completion too mm. but he appears at least to represent the dark pole of the animus for women yeah. And she toys with him but can't do without him yeah. because she's also still looking for that other aspect of Adam and she teases him along and by doing that gets him to do the work that she needs to be done uh, and he acts out in the world in that very dangerous uh, way yeah. uh, and he interacts with lots of other women characters both in the 17th century and in the contemporary period in a way which really plays out that dark destructive uh he's a very handsome man as well he's got he's the full package in the in the traditional archetypal sense mm. uh, vast intelligence vast experience uh totally dedicated to her as well the ultimate weaponized animus yeah. in fulfills service all the requirements, in, fulfills it? all the all the requirements and he knows that mm. and he has to be prepared for that mm. and he's not going to have it he's not going to accept it and if necessary he would find a way to destroy her if he could yeah he'd do it too he would do that too mm. um because mm. he would take that as being the ultimate betrayal mm. which of course it would be and of course she's planning to do that so even at that level where you have a human who uh, he did start out as being a human being but he's been if he's developed himself through hermeticism through alchemy uh, over the centuries and through his relationship to Lilith he's in a position but where potentially he could challenge her mm. uh, and she knows that she needs it indeed uh, because nobody else could <laughs> um, if she doesn't have that element active in her psyche she would inflate mm. Um, mm. to a ridiculous extent mm. and you see that with 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 animus possession in you do. women don't you where you do. it's, it's not corrected for yeah you do you do so uh, yeah he's a mysterious character um, he has a German name uh, when we meet him he's not German mm -hmm. before that he had a French name he was uh, a Cafar credence a knight of the Cafars I'm sure the guys on the discord will know that the Cafars essentially were a Gnostic sect before that he was Armenian 
and I'm sure the guys again on the Discord will know that if the Garden of Eden has a geographical location, it is in modern Armenia. There's lots of support for that academically as well. Um, <coughs> don't have the time to go into, into that fact here, but that's why he is Armenian. Mm -hmm. He's literally of Lilith's own blood soil himself. So he's a distilled human, but augmented human in relationship to her, and therefore the product incarnate of her spirit. She basically created him by her behaviour. Mm. As surely as Adam got the the Lilith, the his consciousness allowed. So you could almost say you get the anima or the animus you deserve. You do, according to your conscious level. according yeah. to your level of consciousness. Mm. Which is why it's difficult and dangerous sometimes to mess around with, with archetypes by Jung's definition of what they are. And you know, myths uh, are safe containers for these forces. If those myths Humanly constructed. That has to be there because otherwise you, you can expose yourself through suggestion to forces that can potentially rob you of your sanity or even of your life. Yeah. So you have to be careful. Yeah. So that's what this is about. It's an archetypal drama of individuation, masculine and feminine. The hero cycle is in it too, and it's it's replicated over and over again with different characters at different ages, because that's how the hero cycle works every new challenge that you you meet that forces you to reframe your life is in effect a repeat of the original hero cycle that you go through as a young man or a young woman mm. so that element is there and even goddesses in this story have to go through it particularly when they become instantiated in this world according to its rules the world of consciousness and the, and the material physicality of the cycle of biological events as Jung called them. Just briefly to go back to Adam, his fall was the fall of the, the original hero allegorically uh, and he fell as happens with the adolescence transition of, of the hero cycle which is the popular one because of a low level of consciousness and a manipulation by forces outside of him. This happens to young men where middle-aged people who run culture, run society, and who have survived being young, have got through that phase, can manipulate young men, in this example, uh, on the basis of their instincts, when those instincts are unconscious. You know, I talk about instincts a lot. I don't mean to surrender to them unconsciously. I mean to have a proper relationship to them. Pauline says, mm. for example, that they should be intact. And that, to me, is an introverted sensing way of saying you have a proper relationship to them consciously mm. whereas Adam didn't mm. in this story mm. so we saw his inflation saying I'm the most important thing ever you know I'm the first man and you must be subservient to me sorry no and that's the beginning of the fall that's the allegory in everyday life in, in lifespan development you get that idea of young men being heroic they're the ones who tend to go out and fight the wars and who sacrifice themselves. And they do that because they're under instinctive pressure to do it. Because there is a genetic com competitive element which, which uh, will select those who will survive, who will get through. There is that element, but there are other elements to, to do with that. <coughs> elements that have to do with the transcendent, that have to do with individuation, and the repeating cycle that will follow after that. So... You, you basically have a young person and they can't help this because um, unless you're an individuated person by the time you're 12 and fully conscious and so forth, you're going to go through that phase of having to compete and adapt. Um, and then you have the hubris which comes from a narrow but bright ego consciousness. But without that you won't compete, you need that drive to compete. But it does lead eventually to life hurting you hitting you and then you have a fall from that level of consciousness and then a rebirth into adulthood where you're different but it's not over at that point it happens again and again and again certainly in every decade of life and certainly with, with every new adaptation or frame shift you have to make and it's not just men it's women too mm -hmm. and it has to do with all of the, the biological and psychosocial cycles of change and competition that, that, that come for women mm -hmm. Women sometimes, I think, tend to, unfortunately, try and repeat the biological 
cycles yeah. and, and again you, you probably see something of that coming through in the story too where um, you know Lilith is attracted to some of the, the younger men they're almost sort of boy bander yeah. types yes um, but they're, they're they're just not enough for her no. in, t in, in terms of her own development no. And like I say, you see that in the real world with women who maybe have children uh, and raise a family, and then they they have it. And if they do it when they're very young, they're still young when their family leave mm -hmm. home. Um, and sometimes there's a, a desire to just repeat that cycle yeah, again, over and over again, over and over again yeah. to ha to have more children, or to yeah. find a new mate, or a yeah. toy boy, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and they never get beyond that reproductive no. cycle or they invest in their own grandchildren yeah. but there's little in the way of um, their own psychological intellectual yeah. spiritual yeah. development yeah. Uh, and, and and that's sad really it's, it's, it's when women get locked into that it is sad and you see that you see for example how Lilith punishes a lot of these women who are in a reproductive cycle when she actually hits a maternity hospital yeah uh, and th th there's this great horror caused uh, before she really uh, releases her contagion, her spite against Eve and her reproductiveness, her fecund the fecundity Fecund of her yeah. children has to be slighted mm. and she does that. Mm. She also goes for a character in the story who is a young analyst who's about to go into the, um, the final adaptation stage of his life. He, in terms of his hubris, regards himself as being complete. He's been through it all, he's seen it all and there's nothing left to do. He's taken on the mantle of the wise old man and begun to retire from engagement with life and with himself. In that sense, he has, you know, he's unconscious of it, despite his life experience, created the anima in its negative form, which Lilith feels and is drawn to him and challenges him in a way which breaks everything he's ever believed in and pushes him to the, the edge of his own death uh, and final confronta confrontation with himself. Although she even sees in him the potential because of his psychological developments mm -hmm. and latent potential that had he been younger, and this draws back on what yes. um, Pauline was saying, that this reproductive instinct, she would probably have chosen him, but he's too old. Yeah. Yeah? He's spiritually developed, but still not quite there. Mm -hmm. So her spite against him being imperfect is to attack him on where his last recessed shadowed corner of unconsciousness is within which will reside his own hubris and his own negative anima she goes for him on that cruelly and gets right inside his psyche she does that with all of her victims until she finds that one young man that she does choose and then when he realizes who he is and what his challenge is and what his ancestral role is and how he has found his eve who also remembers ancestrally her role and he finds Lilith again and remembers his life in Eden and remembers his life in the 17th century he's given that choice to be consort of, a, con, um, consort of a, an immortal goddess and father of the coming world or does he sacrifice himself to save Eve and the world and from, from Lilith's point of view this world's so corrupt well, why not just wipe it Wipe the slate clean, start again. Is that so bad? Is it? Is she really evil? Or is she just that other Eve? Is she just that far memory of the perfect platonic form and complete anima that our ancestors in their lower level of consciousness and us in our personal life as we develop with our low level of consciousness have just messed up our connection with? Yeah, and, and that boils down to the last temptation of Adam in this, the first installments of the Lilith trilogy. And with that, thank you, Steve and Pauline in the past. I think we covered an awful lot today or yesterday because I'm James in the future. Even down to the anima complex, that idea which I never hear talked about ever. The idea you have the archetype in and of itself, but then you also have the complex through which you interact with said archetype, but you can never experience it yourself directly. So I, th I, th I think it was a good show. I think we covered an awful lot. Um, if you guys are interested in picking up the book, Lilith, the first novel, it is available currently. The link in the description down below. You heard, of course, earlier on in the show, me reading a section. I think I'd play a very good Lilith, the actual character Lilith in the, in the film. I've got to grow my hair out, I've got to stand epically on top of a tower and 
breathe and look dramatically. I, I think I do a fairly good job. If you're interested in picking that up, of course, we'd appreciate it. If you would do it, it's always nice to support creative endeavors. They're always much more of a difficult thing to, to get people's attention towards. But indeed, it's the type of thing which Jung used himself to develop his own theories. It's the type of thing humans have used forever as almost a form of healthcare to help each other out and to help themselves out as myths and stories and things like that. And Lilith has been designed, although unconsciously, there is an element of design in there towards trying to get that psychodrama out between the anima and the animus, which is hugely important for us on this channel, as you guys know. So with that, take care. Appreciate you.